Hello, today's video is about client-side Blazor with .NET Core 3.1 preview. Now the version of .NET Core that I have is this. It's 3.1.100 preview one. This is the one I'll be using. The reason we need this is because client-side version of Blazor requires the preview version. Whereas the server side of Blazor works fine with .NET Core 3.0, the production version. I used this site to set up my environment. And after I did that, I had to install .NET Core 3.1 Preview SDK from this site. And also, I had to run this .NET command in order to install the template for Blazor client side. Now let's go over to this site and see what they recommend. So this site is where they give you advice on how to set up your environment and you just need to go through these steps here. And as you can see here, it says if you want to have the client side to run this command. When you run this command, what it actually does is if you go to a command prompt, and you do a .NET new minus minus help, it gives you this option here where you have a template for installing Blazor WASM, which means Blazor Web Assembly. If you don't run this command, you will not get that template. So let's get started by building our first Blazor client-side application. So I'll start Visual Studio 2019 and I will create a new project. For the template, I'm going to write into the filter the word Blazor and it will filter for me Blazor app. So this is the template I'm going to be choosing. I'm going to click on this. Next. Here, the project name I will call Blazor client and the solution I will call school. So my project name is Blazor client and my solution name is school. And the reason I did this is because under this one solution, which is school, I'm going to have three projects. I'm going to have Blazor client. I'm going to have a class library and I will also have a web API project. So let's continue. I'll click on create and over here, we get this option. Now, if you go to the drop down list and change it to 3.1, you will get another option. This is the option we're going to be working with today the WebAssembly app. This essentially is the client side Blazor app. So I'll choose this and create. It will open up in a browser and you will see something like this. You've got three things that you can do here. You can go to the home page. You can click on counter. You can click on fetch data. There are these pages that we have in the template. We have a counter, fetch data, and index razor. This here is the home page. And this is another option, fetch data and counter. So while running this, you can see that, yeah, we've got home, counter, and fetch data. Let's look at counter. When you look at counter, it's actually using this counter page right here, counter.razor. If you look at what this razor page looks like, well, at the very top here, it's got slash counter, and that represents really the route. If you want to hit this page, you have to go slash counter. And these are nothing but HTML tags. This is also an HTML tag, but it's got this on-click event handler, which means that when this button is clicked, it's going to call this function called increment count. And notice that this is in a code block. So, so what does the increment count do? Well, at the beginning, we have a variable called current count, which is an integer, and it's declared with value zero. Increment count, whenever it's clicked, it's going to increment the current count by one. And that's what's happening here. 
if we go to this application and I click on this button here, it's going to increment the value of that variable by one. Let us make a small change here. Let's say that current count is going to be incremented by 10. So if we save this and we come here and say refresh our application, click, it hasn't taken. So this is one thing about Blazor at this point in time when you do a hot change, you have to restart the application, otherwise it will not take. So I'm going to close this and restart it again and see if it's going to work with increments of 10. If I go to my counter and I increment, it increments by 10. Let's see what exactly is being downloaded to this application, F12 in Chrome. And over here, if I come and I look at the network traffic and I do a refresh here, you will see that there are a bunch of DLLs that are being downloaded. So this is actually running C sharp code. Let's close this and look at something else. If you want to debug, you can do this. You should hit on the keyboard Shift Alt D. And when you do that, you will get this message. And this message says that in Chrome, you can debug this application by closing Chrome and doing a win R and running this command. So let's do that. I'm going to copy this, close my Chrome, go into WinR and paste this in this place here. And if I hit OK, it's going to open my Chrome again in a different mode. Now in this mode, if I do Shift Alt D again, it will take me into a debug window. And in this debug window, I can pretty much see all my pages and I can debug. So let us say I want to stop here. So I can click on a breakpoint here, go back, go to counter, click me, and what happens? It actually stops at that breakpoint. So there's a bit of debugging. The debugging is not 100% mature yet, but this is where it's going so that you can actually do some client-side debugging. So let's close this browser and go back and run again in Chrome without debugging. Let's look at fetch data. What is fetch data doing? It's pulling up some information. So let's go and inspect what that razor page does. If you look at that razor page, you will see here that at the bottom there's some code. And what's being declared here is an array of weather forecast object. This on initialized async, it is the entry point into this page. In this entry point into the page, there's an async get JSON method that is making an HTTP request to this endpoint. And this endpoint happens to be a file on the system in the sample data folder. And the sample data folder is in the WW root folder. And you can see in there, there is like a JSON file. So this JSON file is being read as an HTTP endpoint and it returns an array of forecast objects, which is weather forecast objects. Once that array is returned, then you can see here that the, this chunk of UI, it checks whether array is null or not. If it's null, it's going to display this loading message. Otherwise, it's going to load this array of forecast objects into a table. Let us extend this Blazor client-side application so it does something more useful. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a web API using ASP.NET Core and have this Blazor application interact with that API and carry out some CRUD operations. I want to create a student API service. That student API service, it will need a student class. And the Blazor app also will need a student class. So for proper architecture, I will create a class library. And the only thing that class library will have is a student class. So to this project, let us add a new project. 
and let me filter on library. I'm going to choose this template, the class library.net standard. Choose this and go next. The name of this library, I'm going to call it school library and click on create. I will rename this file here from class1.cs to student.cs. I'm going to come here, do a rename, and call it student.cs. It's going to tell me, do you want me to rename the class? I'm going to say yes. So it's going to change the name of my class to student2. This will be my student class. Now, this required is not known. And because this is a class library, I just can't come and select the package that it needs, which is the component model annotations. This means that there is a package that's missing. So let's go and install a package inside of the school library by going to the command prompt. In here, we're going to run the following command. I'm going to add package system component model annotations to the library project. And here it is. Let's go back. Now I should be able to resolve this namespace. The next thing is, let us add a web API project to our solution. So I'm going to come here and go add new project. I'm going to choose ASP.NET Core Web Application. And I will call this project School API and API. So these are the selections that I made. .NET Core 3.0 and API here. Click on Create. Now this Web API application is going to be using SQL Server and Entity Framework. So there are some packages that we need to add to this project. So let's go to a command prompt here at this level and enter the packages that we need to install. These are the packages that I need. I'm going to copy all of this and paste it here. The next thing I need to do is add a connection string to my app settings. And I'll add it at the top here. So the name of my database will be called Blazor School, and we're going to be using LocalDB here. Now, we definitely need to have a context class. So I shall create a folder here under my school API, which I shall call data. And inside of this data folder, I'll create a context class. And my context class will be called school DB context. And the code for my DB context will be as follows. Looking at this DB context class, let me first resolve all the namespaces. The student class cannot be found. And this is because I need to make a reference from my API project into my class library project. So let me do that. I'll come here and go add a reference and then add the school library reference into my API. Now that I've done this, I should be able to resolve my student objects. And there we go. So this is my school DB context class. I'm declaring that I have a DB set of student objects, which I shall call students. This is the constructor that's passing the options to the base class. And here I'm seeding four records into the database. Let me close this and save. The next step is to add some code in my configure services that's going to link my connection string with my context class and the fact that we're using SQL Server. So we'll go to our startup class on the API side and add some code in the configure services method. This is the code we need to add here. Let's resolve these namespaces. At this point, 
we are in a position to do migrations. I shall go into a command prompt at the API project level and run some migration. The first migration command is going to be this dotnet ef migrations add m1 is the name of the migration the context class is school db context and i want the output to go to my data migrations folder so let me hit enter here it says the build failed so let's find out why let's rebuild in visual studio come back in here and rebuild again and it seems to be working i'm gonna try again to do a migration and that seems to work if you inspect this folder here you will see that it created for us some migration commands let's create the database by doing dot net ef database update and this should create for us the database so now that we have our database in place and we have created an API project. We should be able to scaffold a controller that will work with the student table in the database. So let's come here under controllers and go add controller. And I'm going to choose this API controller with actions using entity framework. So let's choose that. Go add and choose the student class. The only context we have is this context. So I've made these choices here. I'll click on add and it will create for me a student's controller. Okay, now we have a student's controller right there. If I want to run my school API application, I can highlight this and go control F5 to run it. We're going to see the weather forecast service which is the hello world built-in service but we're not interested in that we're more interested in our api students service so i'm going to close this and let's go into this file launch settings under properties and if you edit this file in two spots here instead of weather forecast we wanted to go to api slash students so this becomes our home service i'm going to copy that and put it down here in two spots so now if i run my application again it should default to my service and there we go this is actually my service which has a bunch of student names let's step back now and try and understand what is it that we're trying to do we're trying to consume this service from blazer and unless we implement cores into this api service it won't work so our final step is to enable cores inside of this api service to do that we need to go to the startup on the api service side and add some lines of code the first line of code goes into the configure services method where we have to add a course policy that we're calling simply policy and it's going to allow any origin any method any header we will also add another line of code in our configure method in startup.cs and it simply says that this policy will be used and finally in the controller itself in our students controller here we're going to add some line of code at the controller level which we're going to call enable course and we put in the, the policy name which is simply policy and this needs to be resolved now if we run our application there shouldn't be any change as far as we're concerned except that we have enabled cores internally and now it still works i'm going to close my api application and focus on my blazor client application 
in my Blazor client application, I need to create a new page. So I'm going to come to fetch data, copy this, and paste it under pages. I'm making a copy of fetch data. And this new file, I'm going to rename it to students. And I'm going to delete all the code in students and replace it with my own code. So this is the code that we have in the students.razor file. The route to come to this page would be slash students, and we're going to be dependency injecting the HTTP client class. I have a header here displaying the word students, and you can go down here and have a look at the logic. This base URL needs to point to the API service. So let's go to our API service and find out what is the port number that's being used there. You can do that by going to the properties of the API service and going to debug. And you can see here that for HTTPS, it will be 443.00. So this is the port number I need to change on the Blazor client side. So I have to change this to 44300. This method gets called when this Razor page is loaded. And this method is just going to call another method, a method called load. And what does load do? Load makes an HTTP client call to this base URL slash API slash students. So this is supposed to go to my API service. In order to run this, we need to first run the API service and then the client service. You can specify the sequence by which your applications run by going to the solution level, choosing properties, and then here, if you choose startup project and click on this radio button, multiple startup projects, you can set the sequence by which these applications start. So I want the school API to start, and I want also the Blazor client to start. But I want school API to start before Blazor client. So I'm going to move this up. Now, we don't need school library to start because it's not an application. It's a library. So I'm going to click on apply here. OK. We need to make a reference from the Blazor client application into our class library. And that's the whole purpose why we created a class library, so we can share the same code between these two projects, between the API project and the client Blazor project. So I'm going to come to the client Blazor project and add a reference into the school library. It cannot find it. Now, what we can do is go into the Blazor client project, and we can open up this file, imports Razor. And this imports Razor allows us to globally add a using statement that applies to all the pages. So let's do that. So I'm going to come here and add another using statement here, school library. Let's save this and try again. That seems to work. I don't have any errors. Let's run our application. And when we run our applications, there will be two apps that are going to run. First, the API will run, and then the client Blazor will run. If I want to hit my new Razor page, I need to add students to the URL here. And let's try that. You see, this is reading from my API service. It's making an HTTP call and returning an array of student objects. Of course, I'm not going to always go up here in order to hit my endpoint. I'd rather have 
some sort of a menu item down here. How do we do that? Well, if you go under shared, there is this file called nav menu, and this is what manages all the navigation. So let's open this file, and all we need to do is add one of these. So I'm going to add a new line item here, and this is going to point to the endpoint of students. If I run my application again, I should have an option that I can click on to see my student service. And here we go. What remains is for us to be able to add, edit, and delete data. Most of the work will be done in the students.razor file, where we're going to put most of the logic for doing all of this. It's possible for you to take out from the students.razor page some of the logic and put it into other classes. But what I'm going to do today is going to be very heavy on the students.razor page. You can refactor that later on. The reason I do it this way is just it's easier to explain when it's all in one file. So let's go back to our student.razor page. I'm going to add an insert form here. This is very interesting. There's a new tag called edit form, and it's got these tags for data validation, which means that if you set any validations at the model level, it will be honored by these validation tags on your client side, which is pretty powerful. I want to input the following data items, the first name, the last name, and school. Down here in the code, for this block here, I'm instantiating a new student object. At first, this student object will be blank. I just instantiated it. So the bound value will start by being blank. At the bottom here, there is a button, and this button will submit to this handle add method. But how do we know that? That's because the opening tag, edit form, it works on the student model and on valid submit, it will call this method handle add. And what is handle add going to do? It's going to send a JSON async request using the post method to this endpoint, and the endpoint is the base URL API students, and it's going to pass the student object. This will actually insert into the database. This is interesting because this statement, it says on valid submit, meaning it's going to carry out validations on the form first. And if the data in the form is valid, it will submit to the server. Let us run and see what's going to happen. So I'm going to click on students here, and now I have this new form at the bottom. Let me enter some names. I'm going to say Tom Jones. The school is music. And let's submit. It seems not to update. So let me refresh here. The problem I'm facing is that I needed to give the student ID a primary key that has a value. The value of the student ID was reaching to the server as null. So I've decided to create a GUID and assign it to the student ID. Let's try now and see if this is going to work. Close the whole browser and try again. And let's go to students and try again. Tom Jones Music. Click on Submit. And there it goes. It's actually worked. Here it is. The next thing we want to do is 
to be able to update and delete data. In order to update and delete data, I'm going to create an enum that gives me a sense of whether I am in insert mode, delete mode, or update mode. And so I'm going to add some instance variables over here. This is my enum, and it's got mode of none, add, edit, and delete. The default mode is none, and here I'm just declaring a student object, which I'm simply calling S, that I'll be using later on. I want to add an add button at the very top of my form. So I'm going to come over here, and right before my table, I'm going to add an add button. And this is my add button. When the add button is clicked, it's going to call a function called add. So I'm missing the add function. Now all this add function is going to do is that it's going to change the mode to add. In this insert form, I'm going to say if students is not equals to null and mode equals to mode dot add, then it's going to display this form. Otherwise, it won't. So the end result, we need two equals here. Let us check this out and see what's happening. So now when I go to students, I see an add button. Of course, I don't have the form showing. When I click on add, that the form shows up. So this is the same behavior that I had before, except I'm not showing it by default. The next thing we want to do is to add an edit form. So going back to our application here, this is the add form. I'm going to have an edit form at the bottom here. This is my edit form. It's going to display my first name, my last name, and my school. And when the user submits, it's going to call a function called handle update, which is over here. Now the handle update, the endpoint is API students, and we have to pass the student ID. And we're going to make a put method call to the server. We need another form to handle delete. So I'll add another form, which is the delete form. And this goes down here too. And this is the same as the edit form that when the user clicks on the submit button, it's going to call handle delete. All it needs is to pass the student ID as the last part of the URL and make a delete method call and it should delete. How do we select something to delete? I'm going to add two more cells in my table over here. One will have a delete button, one will have an edit button. So here are these two cells. The first cell will display the word edit and the second one will display the word delete. If you click on edit, the onclick method will pass the student ID to a show edit function. When you click on the delete, it will pass the student ID to a delete function. And these two functions, I shall place them in their places now. This show edit takes an ID, makes a get request to the server, grabs a student object, which we call S here, takes the value and assigns it to the student object, which is the model. And it sets the mode to edit. The same happens with delete. But with delete, it sets the mode to delete. We're pretty much done with our application. Let's see if it does what we want it to do. So I'm going to add a user here. And just to make it easy to identify, I'm going to enter A's and B's and submit. And here we go, we've added this. So if we want to edit this, it displays it at the bottom. I'm going to change school to X's, submit, and it changes it. If I want to delete, I can come here and submit again, and it deletes. So it seems to work. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial, and I hope to see you in future tutorials. Goodbye.